continuing where I left off, all Moscow talks of nothing but war. One of my brothers is already abroad, and the other is with the guards, who are setting out their march to the frontier. Our dear Emperor has left Petersburg, and, it is said, intends to expose his precious person to the hazards of war. God grant the Corsican monster who is destroying the peace of Europe may be overthrown by the angel whom the Almighty in his mercifulness has given us for a sovereign. To say nothing of my brother, this war has deprived me of one of the associations nearest my heart. I mean young Nikolai Rostov, who, with his enthusiasm, could not bear to be inactive, and has left the university to join the army. And I will confess to you, dear Maria, that despite his extreme youth, his departure for the army was a great sorrow to me. This young man, of whom I talked to you last summer, has so much nobility and true youthfulness, which is something one rarely encounters nowadays among our old men of twenty. And above all, he has such candor, such heart. He is so pure and poetic that my relations with him, fleeting through they were, have been one of the sweetest delights of my poor heart, which has already suffered so much. Some day I will tell you about our parting and all that was said at that time. It is still too fresh. Ah, dear friend, you are fortunate not to know these poignant joys and sorrows. You are fortunate because the latter are generally the stronger. I know that Count Nikolai is too young ever to be more than a friend to me, but this sweet friendship, this pure poetic intimacy, has fulfilled a need of my heart. But enough of that. The great news of the day which, with which all Moscow is taking up is the death of old Count Besakov and the inheritance. Fancy the three princesses have received hardly anything. Prince Vasily nothing and it is the Monsieur Pierre who has inherited everything and has been recognized as legitimate into the bargain. As a consequence, he is now Count Besikov and the possessor of the handsomest fortune in Russia. It is rumored that Prince Valley played an abdominal role in all this and that he returned to Petersburg very much crestfallen. I confess I understand very little about these matters of legacies and wills. I only know that since this young man, whom we all used to know simply as Monsieur Pierre, has become, has become Count Besikov and the possessor of the one largest fortunes in Russia. I am greatly amused to observe the change in tone and manner of the mammoth's burden with marriageable daughters, and of the young ladies themselves towards this individual, who, between ourselves, always seems to me a rather poor specimen. And as people have amused themselves for the past two years in providing me with suitors, most of whom I don't even know, the matrimonial chronicle of Moscow that makes me Countess Bazooka. But you can understand that I haven't the least desire for this. A propos of marriage. Not long ago, the universal auntie, Anna Mikhailanova, confided to me, under the seal of strict secrecy, a marriage plan for you. It is none other than Prince Vasily's son, Anatole, whom they want to make settle down by marrying him to someone rich and distinguished, and his relations choice have fallen on you. I don't know how you regard the matter, but I thought it my duty to inform you of it. He is said to be very handsome and terribly wild. That is all I've been able to find out about him. But enough of gossip. I am at the end of my second sheet of paper and Mama has sent for me to go and dine at the Apraskins. Read the mystical book I'm sending you. It is all the rage here. Though there are things in it difficult for the feeble human intellect to grasp, it is the admirable book reading it calms and elevates the soul. Farewell. My respects to your father and my greetings to the Mademoiselle Borin. I embrace you with all my heart. P.S. Tell me the news of your brother and his charming little wife, Julie. 
The princess pondered a while, smiling wistfully, and her face, lit up by her luminous eyes, was completely transformed. Suddenly, she got up and crossed to the table with her heavy tread. She took a sheet of paper, and her hand commenced moving rapidly over it. She wrote the following reply in French. Dear and precious friend, your letter of the 13th gave me great joy. So you still love me, my poetic Julie, separation of which you speak so ill does not seem to have had its customary effect on you. You complain of absence. What then should I say if I dare to complain? I, who am I deprived of all who are dear to me? Ah, if we had not the consolation of religion, life would be very sad. Why do you suppose that I should look severely on your fondness for that young man? In these matters, I am hard on no one but myself. I understand such feelings in others, and if I cannot approve them, never having experienced them, neither do I condemn them. Only it seems to me that Christian love, love of one neighbor, love of one enemies, is worthier, sweeter, and finer than the feelings inspired by the beautiful eyes of a young man in a poetic and loving girl like yourself. The news of Count Besselkoff's death reached us before your letter, and my father was much affected by it. He says that the Count was the last representative, but one of a great era, and that now it is his turn, but that he will do all in his power to have his turn come as late as possible. God preserve us from this dreadful misfortune. I cannot share your opinion of Pierre, whom I know as a child. He always seemed to me to have an exceptionally good heart, and that is the quality I value most in people. As to his inheritance and the role played by Prince Vasily, it is very sad for both. Ah, my dear friend, our divine savior words, that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, are terribly true. I pity Prince Vasily, but I am still more sorry for Pierre, so young and burdened with such wealth. To what temptations will he not be exposed? If I were asked what I desire most on earth, it would be to be poorer than the poorest beggar. A thousand thanks, dear friend, for the book you sent me, and which is all the rage there. However, since you tell me that among some good things there are others that are difficult for our feeble human intellect to grasp, it seems to me futile to spend time reading what is unintelligible and can therefore bear no fruit. I have never, never been able to understand the passion certain people have for confusing their understanding by applying themselves to a mystical books that only awaken doubts in the mind and excite the imagination, creating in them a tendency to exaggeration altogether contrary, contrary to Christian simplicity. Let us rather read the Gospels and the Epistles. Let us not seek to penetrate the mysteries they contain, for how can we, miserable sinners that we are, hope to be initiated into the terrible and holy secrets of providence, so long as we wear this mortal husk which, rages, which raises an impenetrable veil between us and the internal. Let us rather confine ourselves to studying these sublime precepts that our divine Savior left for our guidance here below. Let us seek to conform to them and follow them, and let us be persuaded that the less range we, did, we give our frail human minds, the more pleasing we shall be to God who rejects all knowledge that does not come from him, that the less we seek to fathom what he has been pleased to conceal from us, the sooner will he vouchsafe its revelations to us through his divine spirit. My father has said nothing to me of a suitor, but has only told me that he has received a letter and is expecting a visit from Prince Vasily. In regard to this project of a marriage for me, I will tell you, my dear, precious friend, that in my opinion, marriage is a divine institution to which we must submit. However arduous it may be for me, should the Almighty ever impose on me the duties of a wife and mother, I shall endeavor to fulfill them as faithfully as I can without perturbing myself by examining my feelings toward he, him whom he may give me for a husband. I have, rece I have received a letter from my brother informing me that he and his wife are coming to Bald Hills. This will be a joy of brief duration, for he will leave us to take part in this unfortunate war into which we have been drawn. God knows how and why. 
It is not only there with you, in the center of worldly affairs and society, that people talk of nothing but war. Even here, amid pastoral labors and the serenity of nature, so townspeople generally picture life in the country, rumors of war are heard, and make themselves painfully felt. My father talks of nothing but campaigns and counter-campaigns, things of which I understand nothing, and the day before yesterday, when taking my customary walk to the village, I witnessed a heart-rending scene. It was a convoy of recruits, conscripted from among our people, being sent off to the army. You should have seen the state of their mothers, wives, and children of the men who were leaving. You should have heard the sobbing on both sides. One would think mankind had forgotten the laws of its divine Savior, who preached love and forgiveness of wrongs, and that the greatest merit now consists in the art of people killing one another. Farewell, dear good friend. May our divine Savior and his mostly holy mother keep you in their holy and almighty care, Maya. Ah, you are sending off a letter, princess. I have already sent mine. I wrote to my poor mother, began the smiling Mademoiselle Borin in her maleficious voice, speaking rapidly and bringing with her into the concentrated, melancholy, gloomy world of Princess Maria a quite different atmosphere of complacency and gay frivolity. Princess, I must warn you, she added, lowering her voice. The prince has had an altercation. An altercation, she repeated, with a particular stress on her rolled R, as if listening to herself with pleasure. An altercation with Mikhail Avalanche. He is in a very bad humor, so morose. Be prepared. You know. Ah, dear friend, replied Princess Maria, I have asked you never to forewarn me of my father's humor. I do not permit myself to judge him, and would not have others do so. The princess glanced at her watch, and seeing that it was already five minutes past the time prescribed for her practice on the clavichord, went to the sitting room with a look of alarm on her face. According to established order of the day, the prince rested between twelve and two o'clock, and the princess played the clavichord. Chapter 23 The gay, gray-headed valet sat in the anteroom, drowsily listening to the snoring of the prince in his immense study. From the other end of the house, through closed doors, came the sound of difficult passages, twenty times repeated of a dusex sonata. Meanwhile, a coach and Briska had driven up to the porch. Prince Andre got out of the coach, helped his little wife to descend, and helped her pass into the house before him. Old Tikhon, wearing a gray wig, thrust his head out of the anteroom, announced in a whisper that the prince was resting, and hastily shut the door. Tikhon knew that neither the son's arrival nor any other extraordinary event would be allowed to violate the routine of the day. Prince Andre evidently knew this as well as Tikhon. He looked at his watch as if to ascertain whether his father's habits had changed during the time he had not seen him and having satisfied himself that they had not turned to his wife. He will get up in twenty minutes, he said. Let us go to Princess Maria. The little princess had grown stouter during this time, but her eyes and the short, downy upper lip, which lifted in a smile when she began to speak, were as merry and winsome as ever. Why, this is a palace, she said in French to her husband, looking around her with the same expression people could have when complimenting the host at a ball. Come quickly, quickly, and she glanced back, smiling at her husband, at Takon, and the footman who was accompanying them. Is that Maya practicing? Let's go quietly and surprise her. Prince Andre followed her, her expression polite but melancholy. You've grown older, Takon, he said in passing, as the old man kissed his hand. Before they reached the room from which the sounds of the clavichord came, from one of the side doors out sprang the pretty fair hair, Frenchwoman, Mademoiselle Borin, apparently beside herself with joy. Ah, what happiness for the princess, she exclaimed. I must let her know. No, no, please. You are Mademoiselle Borin, said the little princess, kissing her. I know you already threw my sister-in-law's friendship for you. She isn't expecting us. They went up to the door of the sitting room, from which came the sound of the same passage repeated over and over again. Prince Andre stopped and knit his brows as if anticipating something unpleasant. The little princess went in. The music broke off in the middle of the passage. A cry was heard. The princess Mario's heavy tread and the sound of kissing. 
When Prince Andrei entered the room, the two princesses, who had met only once before at his wedding, were in each other's arm, warmly and impulsively kissing each other again and again. Mademoiselle Bernie stood near them, her hands pressed to her heart, smiling blissfully and apparently torn between laughter and tears. Prince Andrei shrugged his shoulders and frowned like a music lover hearing a false note. The two women let go of each other, then, as if afraid of being remiss, seized each other's hands, kissing them, drawing apart, again kissing each other's faces, and all at once to Prince Andrei's complete astonishment, both began to cry and the commencing commenced all over again. Madame Mademoiselle Bernie cried too. Prince Andrei was decidedly ill at ease. But to the, the two women it seemed quite naturally that they should weep. It would never have occurred to them that it could be otherwise at this meeting. Ah, ma chère! Ah, Maria! Marie! Both began talking at once and then laughed. Last night I had a dream. So you didn't expect us. Oh, Marie, you've grown thinner. And you've grown stouter. I recognized the princess at once, Mademoiselle Borden Jane interjected. And I had no idea, exclaimed Princess Maria. Oh, Andre, I didn't see you. Prince Andre and his sister took each other's hand and kissed, and he told her she was as great a crybaby as ever. Princess Maria's warm, loving, gentle gaze rested on her brother's face, and at that moment her large, luminous, tear-filled eyes were very beautiful. The little princess talked incessantly, her short, downy upper lip continually and quickly alighting on her rosy lower lips, instantly to be drawn up again in a smile of sparkling teeth and eyes. She recounted an accident they had on the sassy Spassky Hill, which might have been serious for her in her condition, and without pausing informed them that she had left all her dresses in Petersburg and heaven only knew what she would wear there, and that Andre was quite changed, and that Kitty Adaraska had married an old man, and that there was a suitor for Prince Maria, a real one. But of this they would talk later. Princess Maria continued to gaze in silence at her brother, her beautiful eyes full of love and sadness. It was clear that she was following a train of thought unrelated to her sister-in-law's talk. In the middle of an account of the latest feat in Petersburg, she turned to her brother. So you are really going to war, Andre? she asked, sighing. Lisa sighed too. Tomorrow, in fact, he replied. He is abandoning me here, God knows why, when he might have had a promotion. Princess Maria did not listen to the end, but pursuing the thread of her own thought, turned to her sister-in-law, and with a tender glance at her figure asked, Is it certain? The little princess's face changed. Yes, it's certain, she said with a sigh. Oh, it's so dreadful. Her lip drooped. She put her face close to her sister-in-law's and unexpectedly burst into tears. She needs to rest, said Prince Andre, frowning. Don't you, Lisa? Take her to your room and I'll go to father. How is he? Just the same? Yes, just the same. I don't know how he will seem to you, responded Princess Maya joyfully. The same schedule, the same walks in the avenues, and the laugh, asked Prince Andre, with a barely perceptible smile, which showed that, in spite of all his love and respect for his father, he understood his weaknesses. The same schedule and the laugh, as well as the mathematics and my geometry lesson. Princess Maria answered happily, as if geometry lessons were one of the greatest delights of her life. When the twenty minutes had la elapsed, and the time had come for the old prince to get up, Tikhon came to summon the young prince to his father. The old man had made a departure from his customary routine in honor of his son's arrival. He gave orders to admit him to his apartment while he was dressing for dinner. The prince dressed in the old style, wearing a caftan and powdered hair, and when Prince Andre entered his father's dressing room, not with the peevish expression and attitude affected in drawing rooms, but with the animated look he had when talking to Pierre, the old man wrapped in a dressing gown and seated in a deep Morocco leather chair was having his hair done by Tukhan. Ah, the warrior, so you want to fight Bonaparte, he said, shaking his powered, powder head as much as the braided pigtail held in Tukhan would allow. You better set about it properly or he'll soon have us on the list of his subjects. How are you? And he held out his cheek to him. The old gentleman was in excellent humor after his nap. He used to say that a nap after dinner was silver because dinner golden. 
He cast delighted sidelong glances at his son from under his bushy eyebrows. Prince Andre kissed his father on the spot indicated. He made no response to his father's favorite topic of conversation, ridiculing the military men of the period, Bonaparte in particular. Yes, father, I've come home to you, bringing a pregnant wife, said Prince Andre, following every movement of his father's face with an eager, respectful look. How is your health? Only fools and libertines are unhealthy, my boy, and you know me, I'm busy. From morning till night, and abstemious, of course, so of course I am well. Thank God, said his son, smiling. God has nothing to do with it. Now tell me, he continued, returning to his hobby, how the Germans have trained you to fight Bonaparte by this new science you call strategy. Prince Andre smiled. Give me time to collect myself, father, he said, with a smile that showed that his father's foibles did not prevent his loving and respecting him. I haven't had time to get settled yet. Nonsense, nonsense, cried the old man, shaking his pigtails to see whether it was tightly braided. Then, grasping his son's hand, the house is ready for your wife. Mario will look after her and show her everything, and they will chatter like magpies. That's a woman's business. I am glad to have her. Sit down and talk. About Mick Helson's army, I understand. Toll stories, too. Simultaneous debarkation. But what is the southern army going to do? Prussia is neutral, that I know. What about Austria, he asked, getting up from his chair and walking about the room with Tarkan running after him, handing him various articles of clothing. What about Sweden? How will they cross Pomerania? Prince Andre, feeling the urgency of his questions, at first reluctantly, then with increasing animation, and from habit unconsciously falling into French, commenced explaining the operational plan of the proposed campaign. He told them how an army of 90,000 was to threaten Prussia in order to put an end to her neutrality and draw her into the war. How part of the army was to join the Swedish troops at Strasland. How 220,000 Austrians with 100,000 Russians were to operate in Italy and on the Rhine. How 50,000 Russian and as many English were to land at Naples. And how a total force of 500,000 was to attack the French from several sides. The old prince did not evince the least interest in this account, but walked about as if he were not listening, and continued to dress three times unexpectedly interrupting. Once he stopped him to say, The white one, the white one. This meant that Tikhon had not given him the waistcoat he wanted. Another time he interrupted to ask, Will she be confined soon? And shaking his head reproachfully said, That's bad, go on, go on. A third interruption came as Prince Andre was finishing his account. The old man began to sing, Mo brox en vetelga de se qua vendra. His son only smiled. I don't say it's a plan I would be in favor of, he said. I'm only telling you what it is. Napoleon, too, has formulated a plan by now, no worse than this one. Well, you told me nothing new, said the old man, and he absolutely and rapidly commenced humming under his breath. Dia sa qua veranda, go to the dining room. Chapter 24 At the appointed hour, the prince, powdered and shaven, entered the dining room where Princess Maya, his daughter-in-law, and Mademoiselle Borin were awaiting him. With them was the Pierre's architect, who by some strange whim of his employers was admitted to the table. Though his insignific insignificant status could not possibly have led him to expect such an honor. The prince, a stickler for social distinctions, rarely admitted even important provincial officials to his table. But he had an unexpectedly chosen Mikhail Anvanich, who had always went into a corner to blow his nose in his checkered handkerchief, to demonstrate that all men are equal, and had more than one impressed on his daughter that Mikhail Avinich was not a wit horse, then you or I. At dinner, the prince addressed himself to the taciturn architect more often than to anyone else. In the dining room, which all the other rooms in the house was exceedingly lofty, the members of the household and the footmen standing behind each chair were waiting for the prince to enter. The butler, napkin on arm, was looking over the table setting. 
making signs to the footman and darting anxious glances from the clock on the wall to the draw to the door through which the prince was expected to enter. Prince Andrei stood gazing at a huge gilt frame new to him, containing the genealogical tree of the Princess Bakanovsky. Opposite hung an equally large frame in which was a badly painted portrait, evidently the work of some household artist, of a ruling prince wearing a crown, an alleged descendant of Rurik and founder of the Balkowski family. Prince Andrei, contemplating the genealogical tree, shook his head and laughed as one laughs when looking at a portrait so like the original as to be amusing. How thoroughly like him all that is, he said to Princess Maria, who had come up to him. Princess Maria looked at her brother in surprise. She did not understand what he was smiling at. Everything her father did inspire in her a reverence admitting of no criticism. Everyone has his Achilles heel, continued Prince Andre, but with his tremendous intellect to indulge in such nonsense. The boldness of her mother, brother's criticism was inconceivable to Prince Maria, and she was on the verge of protesting when the footsteps they had all been listening for were heard coming from the study. The prince entered with his brisk, jaunty gait, as if purposely contrasting his volatile manner with the rigid routine of the household. The big clock struck two as he entered, and the drawing room clock answered it on a higher note. The prince stood still, his keen, glittering eye on their thick, their thick, overhanging brows, sternly scrutinized the company and the resting on the little princess. At that moment, she felt as courtiers do when the Tsar enters. She experienced the sense of awe and respect that this old man inspired in all around him. He stroked her head and awkwardly patted her on the back of the neck. I am glad, glad to see you, he said, and after looking intently into her eyes, quickly went to his place at the table and sat down. Sit down, sit down, Mikhail Avanitch, sit down. He indicated a place beside him to his daughter-in-law. A footman drew out the chair for her. Ho, ho, exclaimed the old man, looking at her rounded figure. You didn't waste any time. That's bad. He gave his usual dry, cold, unpleasant laugh, his lips but not his eyes smiling. You must walk, walk as much as possible, as much as possible, he said. The little princess did not hear, or did not wish to hear, what he said. She was silent and appeared to be disconcerted. The prince asked about her father, and she smiled and began to talk. When he asked about their common acquaintances, she began still more animated and talked to conveying their greetings to him and relating town gossip. Countess Apraskina, poor thing, lost her husband and has cried her eyes out, she said, growing more and more vivacious. The livelier she became, the more sternly the prince looked at her, and suddenly, as if he had studied her sufficiently and had formed a clear idea of her, turned away and addressed Mikhail Avanich. Well, Mikhail Avanich, our friend Bonaparte is going to have a bad time of it. Prince Andre, he always spoke of his son thus, has been telling me of the forces being mustered to confront him, and you and I have always said he was a man of no importance. Mikhail Avanich was utterly at loss to know when this you and I had said any such thing about Bonaparte, but realizing that the remark was served to introduce the prince's favorite topic of conversation, he looked in stupid stooped faction at the young prince, wondering what would come next. A great tactician, said the prince to his son, indicating the architect, and the conversation again turned on war, on Bonaparte and the other generals and statements of the day. The old prince appeared not only to convince that all these personages were childishly incapable of understanding so much as the ABC of statementships and military affairs, and that Bonaparte was an insignificant little Frenchman who was successful only because there was no longer any Potyomikins and Sorvoros to oppose him, but also be certain that there was no political difficulties in Rome, that there was no war in fact, but only some sort of puppet show at which these present-day men were playing and making a pretense of some, did doing something real. Prince Andrei cheerfully bore his father's jibes at these men, drew him out, and listened to him with obvious pleasure. The past always seemed good, he said. But didn't that same 
Suvarvo fall into the trap Nurjo set for him and find himself unable to get out? Who told you that? Who? cried the prince. Suvarvo? And he flung aside his plate, which Terkan deftly caught. Suvarvo? Think Prince Andre. The two. Frederick and Suvarvo. Maru. Maru would have been a prisoner if Suvarvo had had a free hand. But he had the Hofschgrid's worst Shanaksgraf on his hand. The devil himself would have been in a tight spot. You'll soon find out what these Hofskrieg's worst Shanap rats are like. So Vorvo couldn't cope with them. So how is Mikhail Kusukfor going to manage them? No, my dear boy, he continued. You and your generals will not wait Bonaparte. You have to call in some Frenchmen. Set a thief to catch a thief. They sent the German Palin to New York in America to fetch the Frenchman Maru, he said, alluding to the proposal which that year had been made to Maru to enter the Russian service. An extraordinary business. What do you think? Were the Pachmans, Severos, and all of the Germans? No, my boy. Either you have all lost your wits or have outlived mine. God help you. We shall see. Bonaparte has become the great military leader among them. Huh. I don't say all those plans are good, said Prince Andre. Only I cannot understand how you have such an opinion of Bonaparte. You may laugh as much as you like, but Bonaparte is a great general. Mikhail Ivanich cried the old prince to the architect, who, busy with his roast meat, hoped he had been forgotten. Didn't I tell you Bonaparte was a great tactician? Here he says so, too. To be sure, Your Excellency, replied the architect. Once more, the prince gave his icy laugh. Bonaparte was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He got splendid soldiers, and besides, he began by attacking Germans. Only a slugger could fail to beat Germans, since the world began everyone has beaten the Germans, and they beat no one, only one another. That's how he made his reputation. And the prince proceeded to analyze all the blunders with which, in his opinion, Bonaparte had made in his campaigns and his statesmanship. His son did not contradict him, but it was evident that whatever the argument might be, he was as little able as his father to alter his opinion. He forbore from making any rejoinder, but he could not help wondering how this old man, living alone in the country for so many years, could know and discuss in such detail and with such accuracy all the recent military and political events in Europe. You think I'm an old man and don't understand the present state of affairs, he concluded, but it preys on my mind. I don't sleep at night. Come now. Where has this great military leader of yours proved himself? That would be a long story, replied the son. You go off to your Bonaparte then, Mademoiselle Borin. Here's another admirer of the pouty, monkey, emperor of yours, he cried in excellent French. You know that I'm not a Bonapartist, mon prince. Du a squat quadan revendra. And the prince hummed out of tune, and with a laugh that was still more so, rose and left the table. The little princess had been silent during this discussion, and the rest of dinner, directing up apprehensive glances now at her father-in-law, now at Princess Maya, when they got up from the table, she took her sister-in-law's arm and drew her into another room. What a clever man your father is, she said. Perhaps that is why I am frightened of him. Oh, he is so kind, said Princess Maya. And I'm going to uh, leave it off there. Thank you so much for watching. Um, give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Leave a comment below. Uh, subscribe or do nothing and continue to watch. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.